so now we're going to talk about dorsal thalamus, which is also thalamus. You can call it dorsal thalamus or thalamus. Um, we're at a mid-sagittal section, front, back. Here's the uh, midbrain, and it gives way to the diencephalon here, and then below this little indent, which is called the hypothalamic sulcus, this is all thalamus, and then the back part of it is the dorsal thalamus. So let's go over to the board. The, the dorsal thalamus is an interpreter. The cerebral cortex does not talk anything besides thalamus thalamuses, okay? Thalamus language. That's what the cerebral cortex understands. So this is very straightforward for a few functions. So for example, auditory input comes in from the medial geniculate, and it's this auditory information from medial geniculate, a part of thalamus, that contacts auditory cortex, primary auditory cortex. And if this is broken, then primary auditory cortex can't get input from anywhere else because it can't understand anyone besides thalamus. So medial geniculate to auditory cortex, responsible for hearing. Lateral geniculate goes to primary visual cortex, V1, responsible for vision. Same thing for ventral basal complex, which also is called, um, the, these thalamic nuclei have hideous names, okay? So once we get into ventral basal, it's ventral posterior lateral and ventral posterior medial. Really catchy, right? But we're going to call them collectively the ventral basal complex. This goes to primary somatosensory cortex, which is responsible for all of somatosensation. So all, not just um, light touch and vibration, but also pain and temperature. Proprioception, you, you don't have a great uh, perceptual interpretation of. Okay. So these are, the, these are straightforward, and another relatively straightforward one is uh, information that's going to primary motor cortex. Well, what information might be going to primary motor cortex? Primary motor cortex is the, is the head, is the chief uh, operator in the motor hierarchy. So it's going to tell uh, other motor neurons, it's ultimately going to tell motor neurons what to do. But it is, the, the message from the motor cortex is modulated by two big important circuits. One is the cerebellum and the other one is the basal ganglia. And neither the cerebellum nor the basal ganglia can talk to motor cortex directly. They both have to go through thalamus. So they go through the imaginatively named ventral anterior and ventral lateral. And typically we're gonna, if we're gonna abbreviate this as VAVL, so these are the nuclei that are involved with motor, uh, primary motor cortex and are involved in making sure that voluntary motor function happens as it should. So these are pretty straightforward and now we get into the really, uh, the really hand wavy uh, areas. So there, there are, think about it from, in this case, think about it from uh, the point of view of the cortex prefrontal cortex is involved in executive functioning. What are, my, what are my priorities? If there's a fire right now, do I uh, take, uh, do I take uh, another swig of my coffee? Do I answer the phone? Do I take my uh, cat? Well, okay, I take my cat. Uh, I, can, I can tell you that. Um, uh, so anyway, it's, it's involved in your priorities. What are your priorities? What are your choices? And, and, and that's informed by emotional emotional regulation. So, so the prefrontal cortex gets input from medial dorsal nucleus. And the medial dorsal nucleus is going to translate information from a wide variety of places for the use of the prefrontal cortex. And in a similar way, the cingulate, which is very important for learning and memory and, 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 and also affective control, is going to get input from the anterior nucleus. These places cannot get input directly from subcortical uh, uh, places besides the thalamus. Okay, so now let's go back over to the slides. And what I've just told you that the thalamus is a necessary translator for this cerebral cortex. So you might think that, for example, in the case of vision, you would get all this input 
from the retina onto the lateral geniculate neuron, and the lateral geniculate neuron would simply pass that information onto the primary visual cortex. That's kind of the, the, uh, a, a simple notion. Um, that was popular for a while, but we no longer, uh, we know that that is, is not true. And so one of the ways in which we know that's not true is that if you look at all the inputs onto one of these, sen one of these uh, dorsal thalamic nuclei, is you'll find out that the, the input that's called lemniscal, so in the case of the um, lateral geniculate input coming from the retina, in the case of the medial geniculate nucleus input, in input coming from the uh, inferior colliculus, and in case of the ventrobasal complex inf information coming from both the medial lemniscus and the spinothalamic tract. So those main inputs are, a com are an incredible minority of all the inputs that these uh, thalamic neurons get. It's less than 5%. So most of what this thalamic cort thalamocortical neuron receives is not the information that it's supposedly uh, passing on to the cerebral cortex. So this is a thalamocortical neuron. A, 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 um, a thalamocortical neuron uh, is the neuron, the principal neuron in each of these dorsal thalamic nuclei. And so what does it get besides uh, the lemniscal input? It gets input from places uh, in the brainstem that give it uh, information about uh, say, behavioral state, so uh, inputs from uh, nuclei that uh, contain serotonin, uh, acetylcholine, dopamine, and this can tell you whether the person is sleepy, asleep, uh, aroused, um, and so on. It also gets input from a, a bunch of inhibitory interneurons, and critically, it gets input back from the cerebral cortex. What this circuitry tells us is a few things. First of all, what we get up in cerebral cortex is not reliably what, what, what came in from the lemniscal input. So we are not extremely accurate, and, and we'll see that when we get into perception. What we see is sometimes what is out there and sometimes not what is out there. So that's number one. Number two is, look at this pathway, about 40% of the input to the thalamic cortical neuron comes from the cerebral cortex to which it's caught talking. What does that tell you? It tells you that the, the, the circuitry exists to allow for you to perceive what you want to perceive or what you expect to perceive. And this is essentially how the, uh, the the um, sensory systems work. You, you have an expectation based on experience, and nine times out of 10, you're right. When I open my eyes in the morning, I'm probably in my bedroom. So I don't have to get a lot of cues. It can be pretty dark, and I already know that I'm looking at, my be I'm looking at something in my bedroom. Um, you don't need to fill in a lot of blanks the likelihood that I've been transported to a hotel room when I went to sleep in my bedroom is nil. So I don't have to, use, I don't have to get a lot of input from my retina. I can, use, I can use expectation. And in fact, I can override anything <laughs> um, coming in from my retina to, to suggest that I am not seeing what I am seeing. Okay, so this, this is the, um, this is the basis of, of what you could call uh, stereotypes. It's also the basis of expectation. And the advantage to this, there's obvious, obviously disadvantages. We've talked, uh, the society is having a very active conversation about the disadvantages of stereotyping. Um, and, but the advantage from a neurological point of view, from a neurobiological point of view, is speed. You don't have to get a lot of information, speed and efficiency. You don't have to get a lot from that from the outside, you already know what's going on, okay? So every once in a while you're wrong, um, that, that's part of the cost. So that is how, like it or not, that's how the nervous system is built. The third thing that we can look at and we can get from this, uh, this circuitry is that 
there's a gatekeeping, uh, there's a gatekeeping um, function to the thalamus. So for example, when lemniscal input comes in, when there's a particular complement of these neurotransmitters, these neuromodulators, serotonin, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine, and, and dopamine as well, then it may be that there's simply no, uh, this, this, is, this gate is shut. So no information will go up to cerebral cortex. In another situation, information may go up to cerebral cortex very, quite easily. So an example of this is during sleep. If, you, um, uh, if somebody talks to you while you're in slow wave sleep, that doesn't come in. You will not repeat it in the morning. You have no memory of it. Whereas if somebody, if you hear a sound, let's say you hear a car alarm while you're in REM sleep, the sleep that is the, the period of sleep that is associated with dreaming, you, will, you may very well incorporate that car alarm into your dream. So it's making it through. Uh, you're not remembering it. You're not experiencing it quite in the same way as you would during wakefulness, but the information is making it through and it's it being incorporated into your dreams. Okay. So we're now gonna we're gonna finish this uh, this video with uh, attention paid to the internal capsule. Now the internal capsule, um, all you've heard so far is that it is it forms the physical join between the lateral uh, edge of the diencephalon and the medial edge of the telencephalon. It also contains, it only contains information going down from the cerebral cortex. So information coming up from the spinal cord or from the brainstem cannot reach the uh, cerebral cortex uh, through the internal capsule. It's only containing information that goes down. And there's one exception to that. Of course there is. So the one exception to that is that it contains information that's coming from the thalamus back up to the cortex. What's traveling up from the thalamus is information uh, that is gonna reach auditory cortex, visual cortex, somatosensory cortex. So all of those uh, um, uh, sensory functions of the, of the cerebral cortex travel up through here and the corticospinal tract uh, travels down uh, through the internal capsule. And what that means is that if you have a lesion in internal capsule and that is not infrequent, that is a, a, a frequent area that is lesioned by strokes, um, you will lose all three functions on the opposite side. So internal capsule is a place where a small lesion can have a huge effect. On the right, what we see is uh, simply a picture. If we zero in on this, this is again a a sagittal view, but it's not a mid-sagittal view. It's a sagittal view from the side. So here you see the cerebral cortex. Here is the, uh, is the internal capsule, and you can see that it's coming between the, uh, the, the basal ganglia, the striatum, and, uh, and the thalamus. And here it is. It's collecting information from all over the cerebral cortex and coming in it's coming in from both sides and coming down. It's a fan in 3D. So you can see the fan-like fan -like structure of the internal capsule right here. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow a particular pathway through the telencephalon. We're gonna follow the visual pathway. <laughs>